Welcome to the end of Module 5. In this video, we're going to be doing something slightly different than we often do, which is to summarize the big picture of the module. In previous modules, we've had several different topics that have a consistent theme, but couldn't be easily summarized in one single smaller video. Here, we've been learning about how stars um, are born, live their lives, and die, and we want to make sure that we have this broader view of how all of that fits together. So a lot of the questions, um, or a lot of the slides in this video, are going to be questions that I really want you to pause and give your attention to, because these are questions that are coming after this longer discussion of all of the different ways stars live their lives. So for this first question, we want to think about what will happen to our own star, the Sun. So pause the video to think through the options as long as you need. Now, one of the things that we started to reckon with, and that I really want us to understand, is that less than 1% of stars can go type 2 supernova at the end of their lives and leave behind the really cool things. Most stars just become steadily cooling white dwarfs, and our sun fits into that category as well. The answer is three here. Because it is not massive enough that its core would leave behind a neutron star or black hole, because the core of those objects needs to be more mass than the entire sun has right now. So instead it will leave behind a white dwarf that is going to be about the size of Earth. So when we think about the chapters that we've been covering, we started out understanding that protostars form out of clouds of gas and dust. Those clouds of gas and dust are called nebulae. As stars form, planet systems can also form, and exoplanets was a um, component of this module as well. Then for 90% of their lifetimes, stars fuse hydrogen into helium in their cores. Just the core is hot enough and dense enough, so all the outer layers stay hydrogen. But when that fusion shuts off, the delicate balance that was holding everything together between the inward pull of gravity and the outward push of pressure falls apart and the core begins to um, condense, but the outer layers see this hotter core and so they expand and the stars become giants or supergiants. There can be additional stages of fusion for nearly all stars. The triple alpha process will turn the helium into carbon. For higher mass stars, they can get all the way up to iron. Those details are relevant and important too. But in the end, every single star, once all the fusion turns off, can leave behind a stellar remnant that is what its core used to be, and the outer layers have to leave, and they leave in an event that might be um, more gentle, like a planetary nebula, or more intense, like a type 2 supernova. The paths that we care about for our curriculum are limited to three possible options. We could have a low mass star, a medium mass star, or the highest mass stars. So these, these pictographs are showing you information we've already talked about. The numbers on the left and the right um, aren't essential to memorize, but they are extremely relevant to reference when needed, especially when we're doing projects where we've um, got a star, we need to know what will happen to it. So if you want to pause and draw all this out, I encourage you to. Um, you can also play around with the clickable link in the posted slides here for star in a box, where you can test a bunch of different masses and see how all of this works. But I really want you to feel confident with these three possible options and really being able to distinguish what the core does, what stellar remnant the core leaves behind, and what the outer layers do. So to make sure that we've got lots of different options to choose from and how we think about this data, how we put it into our notes, how, we, how we're processing it, I also want to put this um, table of information up, which is the same table of information. The original star's mass, and we put the lower limit there because we did talk about how if a star doesn't have enough mass, it won't be a star, it'll be a brown dwarf. The core is that key dense object that gets left behind. Um, and the balance between gravity and pressure outwards, if we have a stable object, there will be a balance. 
What we've learned is that a black hole is not a stable object. Gravity wins. It creates this infinitely dense, single, tiny, infinitely small point. Um, but there is still a range of distance, and then we can have physics work again. The key thing in all of the different steps that we've been learning about is that the mass determines what happens to the star. If we know a star's mass, then we know what evolutionary path it can um, take. So let's think about some of the other terms and ideas that we've learned. So for this question, read the whole question, read all of the options, pause for as long as you need to, and unpause when you're ready with your answer. So this question takes us a couple steps because we have to remember what ANOVA is, or maybe look it up in our notes, that's okay. So ANOVA is that brief flash of surface fusion on the surface of a white dwarf. So we do know that the sun will make a white dwarf, however, ANOVA requires being given extra mass through accretion, and we would need a companion star to be dumping that additional mass on us. So the answer here is three. The sun needs a binary companion, otherwise it's just going to be this stable and slowly cooling white dwarf without any exciting flashes of fusion. So this one will take some thought too, so again, pause as long as you need to, and only unpause when you have your answer. So all of these start with Red Giant to try to hit home the fact that no matter how big or small the star is, we do want to recognize that it has to leave the main sequence into that upper right area where it gets colder but larger in size. So for the first one, we have to start to understand the difference between the supernova types. A type 1a, the first one we learned about, the first one that astronomers discovered, is when a white dwarf goes past its mass limit that is not consistent with the type of supernova that makes a black hole. For option two, a type two supernova is a core collapse supernova, but it would leave behind a stellar remnant consistent with a core collapse um, star. That would be a neutron star or a black hole. Planetary nebula is not gonna be our answer there. We're not gonna have two separate events for where the outer layers go. For option three, if we leave behind this gentle planetary nebula, it means we didn't have anything catastrophic happen with the core. A neutron star is when all of the protons and electrons have um, combined together to make a bunch of neutrons, and that is a catastrophic process. It will create a type two supernova to make that. So three is out also. So our correct answer here is four, and that is also the process that our sun is gonna go through and nearly all stars, most stars. And it's worth recognizing that even our summary is a simplification of all of this. We have these three different things and maybe there's a lot of vocabulary we feel like we have to keep track of. I want us to recognize that that's the slimmed down version for our introductory astronomy class, where it gives us the opportunity to think about the balance between gravity and something else in different contexts. It's applying one big idea to a bunch of different um, situations, which really allows us to build our critical thinking skills without overdoing it um, with these, for example, seven different tracks shown on this uh, graphic, where if we look, those top two options, a supergiant that um, completely annihilates itself in a type two supernova, or a supergiant that somehow sucks all of its um, mass into a black hole before there's a chance to explode, those are possibilities, but they are so rare that they're not well studied. So they're not worth putting into our science course. The third one down is the one that we've introduced. Then that fourth one down, we don't talk about that blue giant phase so much. I even mentioned that briefly when we were um, looking at the Omega Centauri uh, animation, but we do have the type two supernova to neutron star track. And then the one right below that, the sun-like star uh, creating a red giant, then a planetary nebula and a white dwarf. That was the conversation that we, or the answer that we just had in the previous one. So in conversation with that multiple choice, that was our answer on the previous slide. And then uh, it's worth noting that we didn't talk about the fact that if a star doesn't have enough mass, it's still a star, like an M star, uh, it might not have enough material in the outer layers to leave behind a planetary nebula. It couldn't still make a white dwarf, but they last so long that um, many of these small red dwarf stars simply haven't had enough time to go through their whole life cycle 
over the history of the universe. And then at the very bottom, a brown dwarf is not a real star. And so it, um, it just kind of keeps doing its thing forever. It isn't turning on and off different stages of fusion because it never had the full set of fusion processes to make uh, helium to begin with. So we will have a deeper look where we create a flow chart that uses a lot of the summary information as well. Um, so keep an eye out for that one, especially if you feel like you're struggling. And I encourage you to draw that flow chart out with me when we make it in that other video. And as a last note, um, I'll leave us here with the fact that we now start to have enough information to briefly ponder the fact that all of the materials that we see in the room around us, a lot of the materials that are used in the technology that you're watching this video on, whether it's a cell phone or a laptop or something else, um, comes from astronomy, comes from astronomical processes. In module six, we'll talk about um, the start of the universe, which was almost all hydrogen and helium. So everything else in our periodic table had to come from the astronomical events that we've been talking about. So it's, it's quite, it's quite um, interesting to realize just how much this does affect us when a lot of the time we might have signed up for this class because it kind of seemed cool and out there. Um, but astronomy definitely has a direct effect on our lives. So this is the end of module five. I look forward to working with you in module six, our last module of the semester. And thank you for watching.